everybody. Um, I think we have a decent amount of people on, so I think we can probably get started with some introductions. Um, thank you all for joining today. My name is Tricia Holland. I'm the NZBA Secretariat Lead for the Real Estate Sector Working Group. Um, during today's webinar, you're going to hear from presenters at PCAF and Global ABC. They will share some insights from PCAF's recently published guidance on financing the net zero building transition in Europe and how Global ABC's work on building passports can bridge data gaps and provide financial sector actors with information on carbon related risks and opportunities in buildings. We will have time at the end of the webinar for Q&A, so please ask your questions at that time or put them in the chat during the presentation. The presenters today are Madeline Schneider, who's a managing consultant at Guidehouse and the Director of Operations of the PCAF Secretariat, Bjork Ostermeyer, co-founder and managing director at Chill Services and the co-chair of Global ABC's Work Area 5 on building measurement, data, and information, and Jonathan Dewin, Program Officer of Building and Construction at UNEP and Head of the Global ABC Secretariat. With that brief introduction, I'll turn it over to Jonathan to introduce Global ABC. Thank you, Grisha. I, I hope you can hear me. Okay, very good. So I'm not going to take too much time because I think the most important is to dive into the key topics of the webinar, but just to mention that you know, the Global Alliance for Buildings and Construction was created at COP21. And it's basically a platform that brings together uh, government with other key stakeholders of the building and construction value chain uh, to uh, set a vision towards decarbonizing the building and construction sector. And the main idea when it was created is actually uh, that the building sector was one sector that was a bit, I would say, a forgotten sector when we were talking about mitigation. And uh, there was a need to bring it higher uh, in the agenda, especially in the climate negotiations. And I believe that within the seven years that been we've been working now with the Alliance to push this agenda, there's now a strong recognition by most of the countries actually that buildings is a key sector to address. And many countries are now going towards setting targets. Uh, and as you already know, targets that go towards net zero buildings uh, um, in many countries. The targets are rather long term targets because shifting from the way we construct today to mm -hmm. go to net zero buildings is quite a change for the whole sector and requires the whole value chain to work together on this. One of the key things that we are doing is that we are uh, keeping the sector under review. So we produce each year the global status report on buildings and construction uh, to show what the progress has been overall. And then, uh, then what we specifically do also is that, you know, we, like I mentioned, we mobilize countries and stakeholders and what we are doing specifically um, this year is that we are uh, bringing countries behind a buildings breakthrough. So, you know, at the COP26, there were the Glasgow breakthroughs with a number of sectors put forward, like steel, transport, um, and I, think, I believe agriculture now also. But uh, but the buildings was one that uh, we see as a key um, as a key sector also to actually bring towards in uh, at, at least bring the community behind a strong commitment towards net zero buildings. And we currently have about 30 governments that are ready to join this buildings breakthrough that is led by the government of France and the government of Morocco. Mm -hmm. um, and then we are supporting countries specifically also to actually, once they have identified buildings as priority, how to go about it and how looking at you know, their specific context, how can we help them setting their strategy or their vision for the sector related to their specific context uh, in each of the countries uh, with what we are calling the buildings roadmaps and then looking towards the implementation. Overall, when we look at buildings and construction, I mean, it's a major investment opportunity um, and um, it's a key sector uh, for most of the economies. I mean, it represents about 7% of employment in most of the countries, which is more than 200 million jobs in the world. So it's a very important sector for all governments and it's about 11 to 30% of GDP. So it's, so it's critical for, for, for the economy of all the countries. Um, 
and there is a big opportunity in the sense that for every dollar that is invested or every million dollars, sorry, that is invested in renovation and new construction, there is creation about 9 to 30 jobs. That's what the IFC has been putting forward. And um, it's also 1 of the biggest investment opportunity on energy efficiency, which is estimated to be about 24.7 trillion by 2030. So it's a very big investment opportunity. However, uh, you know, it also requires some, some changes. Um, and while we see some progress in terms of investments, uh, over the last year, there was 11% increase in the investment of energy efficiency in buildings. Most of that increase is happening in Europe specifically. Um, but when we look at how much funding there needs actually to go um, into, um, into into the transformation, we're far from being the, to the investments required. Um, so the positive thing is that more and more owners of buildings are actually looking at certification and uh, having, you know, also doing certification of their entire building portfolios. So there is some progress towards, I would say, the people that own buildings to go towards net zero buildings and to have their buildings certified, which is which is a good um, uh, direction that we are taking. So I don't want to take much more time. I think the most important is actually to dive into the work. I mean, in the global ABC, we have a work area on finance, uh, which is an area that we are looking into and which mainly focuses on putting forward tools and methods actually for green building portfolio in development banks, but also other uh, financial institutions. And then we are looking now more closely at uh, integrating whole life, whole life carbon approaches, not only looking at the operational energy of a building, but looking at uh, the life cycle of a building and how to integrate carbon emissions along the life cycle also uh, in the investment area. And then data is a major challenge overall. And so the two work areas, work area four, which is on finance and our work area five, that is on data speak to each other. And we're with our work area five, where York will be speaking about some of our work. We're actually looking at how we can solve or bridge the data gap issue that, that there is in the sector to actually help decision makers making the right decision in this area. I'll stop here and I'll probably hand over uh, back to Tricia uh, to probably introduce the next speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, I think I will pass it over to Madeline to speak on the recent PCAP guidance on decarbonizing buildings. Okay, great. Thanks so much. I, I hope you can hear me well. I will share now my screen. So I hope you can all see the slides. I will put them in presenter mode. So should be fine, right? Yeah, okay, great. So um, yeah, good afternoon also from my side. Um, it's really a great pleasure to contribute um, to this important webinar today by the NZBA and the Global ABC um, on this key topic um, on decarbonizing real estate portfolios. So, um, as already highlighted, I will provide you uh, with uh, yeah, some insights on the recently launched um, PCAF guidance on financing the net zero billing transition. And um, before we dive into the guidance, okay, I will move to the next slide. Yeah, um, I will firstly like to give you a brief introduction of um, PCAF um, for those of you who are maybe not that familiar with its formation. So um, PCAF is short for Partnership for Carbon Accounting Financials, and um, it's a global partnership um, of financial institutions that work together to develop um, and implement a harmonized approach to uh, measure and disclose financed emissions. It's also an industry-led um, initiative by eight financial institutions, which you can see here on the bottom. And um, it also started by um, 14 Dutch financial institutions in 2015 and moved to North America in 2018. And in uh, 2019, this initiative um, went global. So, 
since the global launch, as you can see, um, the number of signatories increased tremendously. So currently we have more than 340 signatories. The target was actually to reach um, 250 signatories until the end of this year, but it was already achieved in April. So this really highlights the importance and need for such an initiative. And the network um, covers all sorts of financial institutions, banks, insurance companies, asset owners, asset managers that currently cover um, more than 60 countries and represent more than 885 trillion US dollars in total assets. As you can also see here on the map, um, more than 140 financial institutions are uh, headquartered in Europe which makes it the largest um, peak of region. And also with that growing number, we felt that um, we would like to build on this momentum to decarbonize the building portfolios, which is particularly relevant for the old building stock in Europe. And maybe just also to highlight here, so this whole group um, committed um, to start measuring and disclosing um, the finance emissions, and out of those, about 100 um, already um, disclosed the emissions, which you can find um, on the PCAF website. So, um, as you are aware, massive efforts are required for the transition towards a net zero economy, and here the building sector in Europe needs particular attention as it contributes to about um, a third of all greenhouse gas emissions. So, to transform this building sector, significant investments are required, and this is where financial institutions play a key role. And also, in order to finance this transition, financial institutions need to decarbonize their um, building portfolios on a large scale. And it's true that more and more financial institutions commit to net zero and join relevant initiatives. But few of them have defined specific actions so far to actually achieve the targets. So here we believe that um, clear guidance is required how to start and how to accelerate um, the decarbonization process. And this is also where um, the PGIF project financing towards net zero buildings um, comes into play. Uh, this project is funded by the Lauders Foundation and um, aims to address um, the need to mobilize financial institutions to speed up the transition of um, European buildings uh, towards net zero. And here PCAF supports financial institutions on this path um, by developing um, various tools and services. One of the key tools um, is the PCAF European Building Emission Factor Database, which was launched in February and um, aims to um, enable financial institutions to um, start the decarbonization process by measuring their financed emissions. And another key tool, um, which I will give you some insights today, is um, the new PCAF guidance, um, which was launched um, this September and um, which um, should provide financial institutions um, with a clear pathway to steer the decarbonization of building portfolios. So this guidance has been developed in close consultation with the core project team of the PCAF project, um, which you can see on the top, um, which consists of a set of representatives from the financial industry from all European regions. And we meet with them on a monthly basis um, to discuss um, progress and such key deliverables, such as the PCAF guidance. And we also developed it um, in close consultation with the expert advisory group. That is a wider uh, stakeholder circle um, comprising of European and global financial and billing sector stakeholders, such as the global ABC. And um, they provided us with key expertise and guidance to also ensure the market relevance of the product. So, as highlighted before, um, action to decarbonize the building sector needs to be uh, increased drastically. And here the financial industry plays a key role. But to take on this role, we believe that clear guidance is required on how to set priorities to decarbonize the mortgage and commercial real estate portfolios rapidly. So this is why um, we launched this um, peak of guidance in September. Um, the, the purpose of this report is to provide support to make the building transition actionable. 
So their objective is to provide clear guidance to financial institutions, how to initiate the net zero journey and how to decarbonize building portfolios step by step. And the guidance is addressed at any financial institution, at any starting position in the decarbonization process. And we believe it's particularly relevant for um, banks and investors with known use of proceeds in mortgage and commercial real estate portfolios. So let us dive now um, a bit more into the guidance. Um, yeah, financial institutions um, approached us, um, approached PCAF, and expressed the need um, for a joint vision of how a net zero building is defined. So specifically, what are the requirements and how to get there? Because, of course, if you want to finance net zero buildings, first of all, it's important to know what are actually net zero buildings. So um, there are already a lot of existing terminologies, but um, there is lack of alignment. So to provide financial institutions with an aligned um, net zero building definition, PCAF attempted to harmonize the existing terminologies and definitions of net zero energy and emission buildings. So you can see here uh, the evolved building definition in bold, um, which seeks to reduce the energy use through energy efficiency measures and supply the reduced use through renewable energy, if possible, on site. And at the same time, a net zero building does not um, generate any on site emissions from fossil fuels and reduces embodied carbon to a significant extent. So, what highly energy efficient means, or what um, reduction of uh, embodied carbon to a significant extent means all of these requirements um, are included in the guidance document. And in addition, we also acknowledge that, of course, not all buildings can be net zero buildings right from the start. So that is why we also included um, the concept of net zero ready buildings. A net zero ready building is essentially um, the same as a net zero building. The only difference is that it uses an energy supply such as electricity or district heat that is not fully decarbonized yet, but will be fully decarbonized by 2050 at the latest. So that means that a net zero ready building will transform into a net zero building without any further uh, modifications required. Here it's also important to note um, that this is also considered a working definition, which may be updated um, and specified over time, um, potentially with um, uh, new regulations that widen the scope or, or um, evolve the paradigms um, come um, into effect. And um, based on this definition, we also derived an overarching pathway towards uh, 2050, which you can see on the top. Um, for financial institutions to steer their actions and strategy. Uh, so, on the way towards net zero, 2030 marks a critical intermediate milestone um, by when um, all newly constructed buildings should be transformed into net zero buildings and energy efficiency renovation rates uh, of existing buildings should, be, uh, should at least double to stay in line with the ultimate target. So that's where we want to highlight that not all efforts can take place in 2040, but actually until 2030 already uh, heavy lifting is required. So this serves as an overall vision for financial institutions to steer their actions. And um, for the actual decarbonization of building portfolios, we defined a stepwise approach for financial institutions, including four key steps from measuring and disclosing of emissions towards taking action. So this approach is based on experiences of financial institutions that already started the net zero journey. And it's also intended as an iterative process with feedback and lessons learned um, feeding into the loop. So on the next slides, I will give you now a brief overview um, on the four key steps and um, corresponding tools. So it all starts with the measurement of um, emissions as a first step in a net zero journey. 
And here, um, data forms the basis on uh, which financial institutions can meet uh, disclosure rules, take next steps, uh, identify highest emitters in the portfolio, set climate targets, and so forth. So um, here, the peak of European building emission factor database um, serves as a key tool for financial institutions to actually overcome data gaps and so to measure and track the finance emissions of their portfolios. And this database is also publicly available and offers a specified set of emission and energy factors um, for mortgage and commercial real estate in all countries in the EU, plus uh, Norway, Switzerland and the UK. Um, yeah, next step in the net zero journey is target setting, which involves the development of climate targets and establishment of a corresponding decarbonization pathway. This exercise can be done with the help um, of the sectoral decarbonization approach by the science based targets initiative. And um, here on the graphic, you can see um, the decarbonization pathway of an illustrative um, commercial real estate portfolio, which highlights, as I mentioned before, the immediate need for considerable efforts before 2030. So here you can see that almost 70% of emissions already needs to be reduced by then for this illustrative portfolio. Of course, that's an example, but um, overall, um, where uh, the message is clear that already until 2030, a lot of um, action needs to take place. Then um, following target setting, um, financial institutions need to create an implementation strategy, how to actually decarbonize uh, the building portfolio in line with the identified pathway. So here um, we provided a, a menu of emission reduction measures um, in the report, which financial institutions can apply according to the finance building types and conditions. And we also include um, illustrative cases that depict how um, modular combinations are possible um, of this menu, depending on the building characteristics. And then the last step, um, the net zero journey um, is all about making the building transition actionable. So particularly through the development and deployment of net zero transition products and services. So here a set of suitable financial products and services such as building renovation passports is presented, um, which possess um, considerable climate impact compatibility with a net zero pathway and upscaling potential. So depending on uh, the finance building types, financial institutions are able to select and implement uh, the financial products to then actually decarbonize um, the building portfolio. So um, these were some insights. Um, I will also stop here, so not to take too much time. Um, you find uh, more information on the guidance, such as challenges that hindered financing um, and at zero billing stock so far on a large scale um, in the guidance, or also um, showcases that highlight how to apply the uh, emission reduction menu. So please take a look. But um, overall, um, the key message of the guidance is, um, which I would like to stress again here at the end, that there is urgent need for immediate action. So strong decarbonization efforts need to happen before 2030 to stay in line with overall Paris climate goals, and especially due to the static nature of the building sector, which takes time to transform. So we hope that this guidance is a supportive tool to enable financial institutions to speed up the required action and take on um, their key role in the building transition. So thanks for your attention and um, I hope I could raise the interest um, in looking and reading and applying this guidance. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Madeline. I think next up, we're going to hear from York on building passports. Yeah, let's. <clears throat> this browser doesn't support sharing, it says. Can you, can you share it for me? Yes, I believe that um, Mount can do so. Yes, I will uh, do that in a minute. Thank you so much. You should be able 
to see yep. the screen and the Great. Steps. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, thanks thanks very much. I'll also try to be brief to to uh, get us some some time for for Q and A in in the end. Um, I worked as an academic uh, for, for 15 years in the field of what we call building stock modeling. And the work on building passports is a little bit a mix of, uh, I would say, 50% opportunity and 50% frustration about, uh, about that work, which is typically modeling decarbonization for larger stocks. And the big problem we always have is the data is missing, and I'll, I'll be coming to that. Um, in 2021, um, uh, these three reports came out. And what is interesting is that um, they are all three by, by different organizations who have not been in contact with each other, and they all virtually say the same. So the left one is from the uh, Global ABC, where we've been uh, authors, uh, the Green Finance Institute in the middle, and the, the, the right one is from uh, BPIE on behalf of the European Commission. And the conclusion is pretty straightforward in all of them. We need central digital data repositories, we need an alignment of data, we need massive investment in data collection, um, and it would be for the benefit of, of virtually everybody. Next slide. <clears throat> this, is, uh, this is the scope of a building passport, and I'll not go too much into that. Let's, let's just say we, we, we expect or, or we wish build, digital building passports or logbooks or however you call them to be digital data repositories in which everything related to a building is held digital and processable. And it's very important that we that we stress the processable part, um, because if you scan a, a newspaper article, well, it's a digital PDF. You can not do a lot with it. And it's even worse when you scan older blueprints. So then not even image recognition is, is going to get you very far. Um, processable or also clearly indicates that it needs to be uh, documented what that data point actually means. We are talking um, on the on the European situation, the existing building stock. We have uh, 27 member states and they cannot even agree on a joint definition for net floor area. So as long as that is not working, um, <clears throat> it will be very difficult to combine uh, and compare uh, larger data sets. The next one. So this, this is also from, from our report. Um, it, it basically lists the, um, the different stakeholder groups and, and, and what they would be interested in. And it was derived by the typical high level um, stakeholder meetings. And, and you actually see up, upper left, the, the second from the top, the financial services are virtually interested in everything but improved data-driven building statistics. And I would not second that anymore. I've talked to quite a lot of bankers actually who are very interested in building statistics because they are interested in uh, having their portfolio perform better than the average or top 30% or whatever. Um, and now the interesting question is, um, if virtually every stakeholder in the built environment is seeing benefits and, and, and sees advantages for his own work in digital building passports, why is it not there already? Um, and numerous stakeholders have tried, and there are some platforms out there. Um, but the typical big problem is that um, they, they, they always generate the platform. And then the question is, how is the data getting into the platform? Mm -hmm. um, and how does it actually work? So it's very easy to have a high-level meeting and say, circular economy is the future. Um, we need to decarbonize buildings. Yeah, fair. Um, but actually, that's that's only the first three percent of the way. Uh, if you have a commitment, great. But then the question is, how do you, how do you, how do you make that happen, and how how to automate it? Um, Jonathan pointed out the uh, huge amount of employment opportunities in the built environment, and I'm always a little bit scared on that, because it also indicates that the built environment is a very labor-intensive sector, and uh, it might be an advantage to generate employment in some countries, but it is a big barrier in others. So we felt that uh, our one of the biggest barriers we have in Europe actually is that we do not have enough experts to collect all the data we eventually actually need to do all the services um, that, that people come up with. Next one. This, this, is, this is a very old slide I always show um, from, from my early uh, university career where we said, well, uh, we, 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 were, we were continuously approached uh, 
we originally worked with cities. They were the, they were pioneering these kind of decarbonization roadmaps a little bit. And then we were over the last five, six years, we are more and more approached by built by property owners. And um, and they want to know what to do to their stock. And um, and and you say, well, um, let's see what data you have, and then we see how we how we tailor the models to actually answer your question. And then you enter a, a six month bullshit bingo interaction while they tell you about how much gold standard asset management and data they have. And in the end, on a good day, they have the right. On a bad day, you get the address, you get the net floor area. They also have the bank account number of their client. That's what they have. Um, it's better in some countries, but generally it's it's that, that, that this is where we are. So legally, every building in Europe needs to have an EPC, an energy performance certificate. But for example, in Germany, you, you, you will have somebody generate that for you. And the only thing you keep is the last piece, the paper, which says this building is a D or an E or an F and you throw away all the data, um, which, which, uh, which yielded that result. So next one. So it's, it's, it was a huge missed opportunity and we have worked, we, we, we took the liberty to flank our, our high level. Uh, work on building passports, where you very quickly get an agreement to flank that with a bottom-up exercise on how such data could actually be collected. And we generated a very, a very simple uh, data collection app, which we iteratively improved. How are people collecting data points? How do you, how do you help people with mid-level expertise? So not a PhD. Who is who is an expert on uh, on building typologies from the 1960s? But a, a facility manager, a technician. How do you enable these people to get comparable data? Because if you send 10 people to the same building and you ask them what's the condition of that wall element, you will get 11 answers, and they they will differ widely. So we worked a lot on that. We worked on that in uh, in several cultural uh, contexts. So next one. This one is in Germany, and the next one, the next one is in uh, in uh, near Marrakesh in in Morocco. Um, we found that 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 people people they 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 so in all of the cultural contexts that we've worked, people struggle with the same things. Um, it's it's just some ways of approaching a data point simply do not work. The moment you the moment you go to interpretation without a clear guidance, example pictures, uh, stuff like that, it, it it just doesn't work. The moment you the moment you trust existing three D city GML models, you're lost. Yeah, the, the the much more trustworthy data source is a satellite picture. That's that's pretty hard to fool. Um, of course, there's there's improvement in other in other sectors as well <clears throat> but uh, so a, a strong focus basically was on how do we get our hands on reliable and robust data with mid-level competent people and how can we scale that uh, and later how can we automate it um, and uh, the, the, the reason the reason I'm saying scaling is that people do not have the budget Normally, at, if, we, if we would have this discussion in a larger group around the round table, uh, by now somebody would have said BIM or digital twin. Um, but, but property owners do not have the money to now invest 5, 10, 15,000 euros to create a digital twin of their building. The question is, what data do we really need to make a reliable uh, assessment? Which brings me to the last part of, uh, of my presentation, because once we had a general idea on how we could collect data fast and at scale. And now we are at the moment, we are, we are below an hour per building uh, for data collection. And data quality is actually pretty good. Um, next, next picture. So th there's a comp accompanying uh, desktop version where you can look at all your data and it's structured very simple. In the, in the left side, you have the photo. In the middle, you have the recorded data. And to the right, you have data which we calculated. So we found it very important that we are very transparent of what data is primary original data, what data is derived or calculated data, what's the definition behind each data point, so you can you can see that in the in the database. 
And we always have photos so that later somebody can look up a building and actually in the office, maybe double check data and have some, some context photos. Next one. <clears throat> Yeah, you can look in the individual walls. We can skip that. The next one. So, and as a final, no, one back. In a, in a final exercise, and that's probably the the interesting part for for the context to the to the financial sector. We had a workshop in Delft um, where we asked uh, the high level stakeholders who are also participating um, at the uh, at the at the document um, the the building passport guidance. And the report that um, th th whether they can visualize the functionalities or the information they would want to have for every building, and and my feeling is that many of them struggled a lot because it's it's very easy to say I want a decarbonization roadmap. The question is, can you can you sketch it and tell me what? what needs to be on that roadmap and of course the the background of that question is we we want to reverse engineer obviously we want to reverse engineer and check if this functionality can be automated because again um we're talking about a relatively quick assessment and there's a huge strength in in digitization not only to make things quicker but also to make it more reliable because even if there if there is an error in the system, at least it's the same error for 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 every building and for every indicator, uh, rather than having uh, two thousand uh, auditors, uh, um, and and they are of very varying quality. So, um, and it is very funny that the the financial sector was they 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 were they were relatively aligned on what they want and what they need so they want a clear strategy behind a building on how it's going to achieve net zero carbon they want to get an idea on how much it costs that question of course comes a little bit more from the people who want to lend money to the people who then implement uh, that that roadmap um and they want to know or uh, no put they want to know whether something has a strategy, even if the strategy is not going to be implemented in, in two, three years. There's obviously a financing problem there, because if I would now go to the uh, to, to, to a big bank and want, I want to finance step one and two, it's actually not taxonomy compatible uh, because it's not, not ambitious enough. But our thinking and, and there was an alignment with the people in, the, in that workshop. We, we, we've, we mainly want a strategy behind the building. We want we want to to know whether they have a plausible way what they're going to do in the next 20, 30 years. Um, <clears throat> next one. So very, very funny. Next next financial guy basically sketched exactly the same thing. We lay out of it. Um, so it, it looks a little bit similar, but the information he requested to be on there is exactly the same. Um, Robert, uh, also, I think, uh, a member in PKF uh, UK. He was very focused on 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 risk and the variety and the exactness of data points. So that was a strong focus. And of course, this is the discussion we need to have: how exact, how robust are our data points going to be? And they are not going to be two percent exact. They are probably more going to be like five five to ten percent exact. So um, that's what he sketched. Next one, <clears throat> and then and then there's the 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 need of people or the interest of people to have a whole life carbon calculation behind every building. Um, there's international standards for it, uh, and again, certain certain boxes of this um, of this chart we can calculate with a higher reliability than others. But but all in all, the, all, all of this that I'm going to show you that was our finding from the from the workshop. Actually, nobody had wishes or ideas that cannot be automatically calculated once you get hold on good data. It's not about the processing. It's not about financing yet another tool. It's about actually getting over the barrier that, that data is, is good, data is transparent, data is under the governance of the building owner, uh, and he can give access to various tools who can then process it and generate the indicator he wants. The next one. Um, yeah, thank you, Jonathan, for that one. Jonathan, uh, because of his work more in evolving economies, highly interested in the delta that can be made in embodied carbon. 
by shifting from standard material to best in class and how to then also benchmark and rank. Um, and obviously with a, with a clear interest on, um, on, on how could, how could a carbon finance mechanism incentivize that shift and what would be the cost per ton of carbon saved. And we are working on that in another project, um, with, uh, with India and, uh, and, and Ghana at the moment. And it's surprising how little data you actually need and how little time you need to invest to actually calculate and automate these graphs. It's not super complicated. And the last one, I think it's the last one. Obviously, the commission, which also was participating in the workshop, they go a little bit more to the extreme of any kind of uh, statistical accounting. So they, of course, want to track the development of building stocks. and. And that was the, the point in time in the in the workshop where actually the banks realized that they want that as well. They want to be able to benchmark the properties that they are invested in, um, where they are. So they, 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 I think they concluded they want these two things. They want to be able to benchmark the properties they are invested in, and they want to be very sure that every building owner um, who uses their money to buy property has an idea on how to decarbonize uh, the, the, the buildings. So these are these are ideas. Again, they are. I think they they are meant to to inspire or encourage um, the, the 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 stakeholders who need functionalities to visualize them to actually clearly communicate what they need. And um, and for us, it's it's very helpful to actually understand what we need to generate in terms of graphs. Of course, the worst case would have been absolutely not possible. The data is not there; it cannot be collected. That was not possible. Everything that I just showed you here can be can be automatically uh, calculated once you have the data. And we will be moving into a large data collection exercises, several large data collection exercises actually next year. And uh, and these are the graphs that we are going to to generate automatically. So there's of course a very clear cost pressure on um, on generating this. So um, we will. We are, we are not talking about thousands of dollars or euros per building. It's it's just money that is not there. We need to be quicker. We need to be cheaper. We need to be faster. So much from my side, and I think that leaves us a little bit of time for Q and A. Thank you, York. So um, yeah, thank you both, Madeline and York, for your presentations. I mean, good to see overall that you know. <laughs> Looking at the, the PCAF guidance also specifically that, you know, we are pointing towards the same targets. I mean, if we want to reach the 1.5 degrees, at least that's what is put forward. We need to decarbonize buildings fully by 2050. And uh, the target for 2030, at least, is to try to get all the new buildings uh, already being uh, net zero operational, ideally. Let's see whether we get there. Um, there was one question. I see there was one hand raised, but it disappeared. I'm, of course, uh, anybody who would like to come in, please raise your hand. But there was one question already in the chat, Jörg, that was to you from Benya Bin Bidabad, yeah. who was asking about the artificial intelligence based data providers um, that there are today and you know, your, your views on that. Um... I, I generally don't don't disagree to to using AI, and uh, typically we are we are we are talking about uh, neural network approaches, for example, who are able to complement missing data points and fill data gaps. We are we are doing that as well. We we build large synthetic data stocks in uh, for the for the European uh, countries in in the past. The problem with all of these approaches is is typically that you need a good reference group and data set to train your algorithms on. Um, and they are typically not there, so it's it's very difficult to generate a robust output there. It's also um, um, it's 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 uh, we we have a certain we have a certain problem when providers basically say that's that's the result for your building, and uh, the and and how we know that is basically we we put your address in our magic black box and that's the output. Take it or leave it. So. That there's a certain lack of transparency. Um, of course, there is other um, there is other uh, large data um, collection approaches, which I wouldn't really count as AI. So LiDAR data, um, high profiles of buildings, image recognition from satellites, um, who are all not on the level of exactness where we need them to be. 
um but they are a little bit more positive once they 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 work then um then they can be they can be very helpful it's, it it depends very much on which exact technology we are talking so i'm i'm generally not against it i just want them to be transparent well documented and i want them to be exact okay, thank you york i don't see any other hands raised for now um in just mentioning that, you know, of course, the building passport is one of the tools that is also put forward under the PCAF guidance in terms of uh, taking action, um, especially to in the context of Europe, we're talking a lot about the renovation wave. So it's about building renovation passports. Um, so, so that's why we made the link between the two presentations. There's a lot more, I think, also in the PCAF guidance overall. And I see now a question coming up in the chat from Carolina Kuna, uh, asking whether PCAF made some projections of the expected emission factors for 2030 and 2050 for the different categories of energy certificates. Yeah, thanks for the question. Um... Yeah, no, there are no projections on that because the, um, this is the more relating to target setting and this is actually, um, for example, including, uh, uh, included in uh, the CRAM pathways. So when you take a look at the car carbon risk real estate uh, monitor CRAM uh, global pathways, there you find also energy and um, emission factors for the, for the projections for each year. And um, we um, include um, emission factors in the database, uh, current emission factors, because they should support assessing the status quo um, of the emissions in the portfolios. Um, based on that, um, next steps can be taken, um, for example, as I said before, target setting, um, et cetera. I think Katie also raised her hand if I see it correctly. <laughs> Thank you for telling you. me. Please go ahead. Katie, we cannot hear you very well, I have to say. Okay, thank you. Um, in the meantime, there was a Question by Claire, uh, York, that is to you specifically. It's asking what can banks do to advance this work on digital building passports, whether it's policy action, data requests from clients, or anything else. It's 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 a it's a tricky one, um, because typically we are we are big advocates that actually the data um, on a building should be held by the building owners or to become a little bit more philosophical the building data should be owned by the building so if you sell the building the data goes with it um the in in the work and in the projects that we do banks are actually the big drivers at the moment they are more visionary to see the value of data they are much more strategic than the housing associations that we work with um when we talk about housing associations they typically own for four, four to 8,000 units, small, medium, they employ 20 to 30 people. They are not confronted with a, with a very senior guy from a large investment fund who's managing billions of, uh, of, of, of euros and assets. So it's a little bit an unfair uh, meeting. Um, I am I'm seeing the trend that actually the banks basically request certain data. And it, 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 well, if you, if I'm, I'm also, I'm also an advisor of the, of, of Wheatley, uh, on the, uh, the large Scottish housing association, 120,000 units. They always got the money. They, they have approximately a, bil a billion in debt. Um, and this year is the first year that the banks basically came and say, we like your story on, on what you do with your, with your, um, with, with our money or with the money that you want to lend. You, you improve energy efficiency, you provide shelter, you improve people's life, you add comfort. Could you, could you put a number to these statements? And they can't. And, and that request is at the moment the big game changer. Of course, it's, it hits the, the large stakeholders first. Um, they have the most capacity. 
but at the moment that's exactly the mechanism that we that we see we we see the banks coming to the clients and say if you want to lend our money you need to document uh what you use it for you need to document the climate impact and you need to prove that you have a strategy and that it's valid and you you basically need to be able to show us the the carbon line for your portfolio and how it's down and and whether it's meeting zero and we want to monitor that and 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 there's really two two worlds are, are they are not used to that the built environment is not used to that they are used to stating that they they want to have three four percent of refurbishment every year first year 1.2 percent second year 1.1 percent in, in in any other industry you would be gone you, you you would not have your management job anymore not in the building sector we are used to basically failing and not meeting our targets so long 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 answer for for it yeah i i think the pressure needs to come from the bank and they basically need to request and say if you want to if you want to get money that's what you need to document that's the information we want to have if not no finance and that's that's happening at the moment that's that's what's happening Thank you, York. So moving to Katie's question, <laughs> Katie Rhodes' question, which is about uh, the definition for net zero buildings. Um, and the question goes to you, Madeline, uh, because in the PCAT guidance, there are there is some definition and there was some discussions about definitions. But so um, Katie is asking whether there are more specific definitions around this. Uh, and then also, uh, yeah providing some examples saying like reducing energy by a certain percentage or reducing embodied carbon by a certain percentage. Um, in the guidance document, so for example, on embodied carbon, um, it states that um, by 2030, at least uh, and renovations should have at least 40% um, less embodied carbon. Um, this is also aligned um, with um, uh, the world GBC uh, and so on. So um, with uh, this overall embodied carbon target, um, kind of as an intermediate um, target towards um, 2050. And um, yeah, you, as I highlighted before, you can also find um, different other requirements um, below the definition in the guidance. For example, um, on um, carbon removals, um, they can be used um, also to neutralize any re residual carbon emissions, maximum 10%. So this is um, also in line um, with SPDI, for example. So yeah, you can find um, this, kind, this different um, uh, rec recommended um, reductions in percentages um, in the requirement section below the definitions and also um, where um, actually these targets um, are not set up by us but are aligned um, with the kind of different initiatives as I mentioned um, by the World GBC, uh, SPTI and so forth. Thank you, Madeline. I mean, this is always a challenging question, I have to say, because even when we talk about 40% less embodied carbon, well, 40% than, less than what? And that's a question that has been asked by a number of people, because actually the, the, the we don't know really, and then it's going to depend on where you are, which country, which building, you know, your embodied carbon will be uh, quite different from, you know, one context to the other, possibly one building to the other. So, yeah, it's not that easy to, to kind of, but some people have been trying at least to put some targets and numbers and, and, and we're continuing working on it. Um, yeah. The next question um, is actually for you also, uh, Madeline, and asking whether there are any guidance that exists for other regions where, and, and data notably, uh, for example, Japan or the US mentioned here. So, please, Madeline. So, um, overall, maybe to clarify, um, so PCAF, the initiative is global. So, as I showed on the map before, um, on each continent, um, financial institutions are part of PCAF and the PCAF standards, different standards um, are all part of PCAF um, and uh, apply globally. Um, just this um, real estate focused uh, work um, is currently um, focused on Europe. Um, because here, as I said, we see really this huge potential um, 
in um, mobilizing financial institutions to transform the particularly old building stock. But um, this uh, guidance document is actually applicable um, to financial institutions worldwide. So the only EU or Europe um, focus are the specific requirements below uh, the aligned net zero billing definition, but the rest um, of the whole document is actually applicable um, to financial institutions worldwide. Thank you, Madeline. And I see that we have Mr. Guido Schellino that has his hand raised. So Guido, please come in. Uh, thank you very much. I would have a question uh, uh, on a topic that was not touched, but I think it's relevant. Uh, there is the just transition also in the real estate uh, uh, industry. In this sense, what we see is that the banks are moving more and more towards strict, uh, let's say, limitation for financing of uh, uh, real estates uh, um, and also regulators for instance in europe there is a discussion uh, um, if it, it is meaningful to 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 make it compulsory uh, a certain level uh, of efficiency and uh, without this level of efficiency you cannot uh, purchase or sell uh, the uh, real estate uh, so i was wondering if uh, this would not uh, then uh, uh, create a, big problems for more disadvantages uh, social groups that cannot afford the renovation or uh, uh, let's say uh, they cannot afford to build from scratch a new house uh, very efficient and so my question is uh, um, are we facing this risk and if yes uh, what can be done to to avoid this thanks thank you guido for your question uh... I don't know whether I will have the exact answer to that. I've heard many people telling me at least that, you know, a number of the solutions are, that are out there are actually not that much more expensive than, you know, the, the more traditional solutions that are used in the building and construction sector today. So that the additional cost or the incremental cost is not that high. And especially that, you know, with the energy savings, it can be recovered relatively over I would say a decent time frame, so I wouldn't be able to provide you with examples just now. But as UNEP, we've done a number of projects actually where we've been working maybe more on the renewable energy side and, for example, solar water heaters and, you know, actually doing, for example, some on bill financing in some countries. So coming up with mechanisms where we could help, you know, with the electricity utilities getting actually um, house or owners of housing actually to get, you know, solar water heaters instead of continuing eating with an electric boiler and they would reimburse, you know, the, the upfront cost through their energy bill with the savings. And then the return on investment was very short. I don't remember if it was three to four years or something like that. And it was a very successful program in Tunisia uh, on that one that has been replicated in a few countries. So I think it's also a question of being uh, you know, finding some of these ways to work with, uh, you know, the, the, the right partners and coming up with some of the, like, you know, financial mechanisms that can actually help addressing those. And then, uh, I mean, I think the work also that at least York has been mentioning, you know, looking at the social housing owners specifically, who are the ones often don't know exactly how to go about, you know, decarbonizing their you know, multiple buildings that they have, it's actually helping them to come up with a strategy can help them to approach, you know, uh, financing uh, a financial institution and potentially more like the green financing also to actually enable them to do the renovations where it's actually the social or let's say the ones that are more disadvantaged that would benefit from this. Uh, overall, I think it's really critical to work more on work more on this residential housing. Residential housing is the one that I think that will have the most challenging in going towards the full decarbonization. The private sector can always do lighthouse projects and show nice certifications and all that. But then getting the social housing, you know, and, and affordable housing to change, that's going to require quite a bit of support from the governments, uh, you know, to actually make that happen. So I don't know. This was my two cents, but I don't know if my colleagues, Madeline or York, want to add something there. And it looks like not. 
<laughs> I, I think we can we can just bluntly create a matrix and see where where different clienteles will will eventually live. You you will have buildings which are very energy efficient and have a cheap uh, rent, cold rent plus the plus the heating rent, and they will be relatively newly constructed buildings. Because if you build a new building, adding energy efficiency actually doesn't create a lot of cost. So these will be the cheapest buildings in the future. The downside is the location that these buildings will be in are not very good. Um, because they will be relatively new. The good spots are taken. The expensive buildings will be those that uh, are hard to uh, to refurbish uh, the, the envelope of. So historical heritage, city center, which need to be zero carbon as well, but they consume a lot of zero carbon energy. And because they consume a lot and probably the location is difficult, well, energy will be expensive. So these will be the upper end. And then you have any kind of, of combination of high high energy consumption, low rent, high floor rent, low low heating costs. And, um, and uh, yeah, well, e eventually if you're middle class, which probably most of us are, then we can decide whether we want to, in the future, live in the building which has a low, um, a low uh, cold rent and uh, high heating costs or um, or high a high rent and, and low heating costs or, or a combination of the two or a balance of the two or and uh, of course just transition is a problem we, we need to make we, we we will have we I think we come down to energy transition has to be paid by the rich because the Thank poor you, have no money so thank you your question uh, conscious of time we're three minutes uh, late I um, I see there's one more question from Carol Bouquet in the in the chat so maybe we can at least answer that one um, and the question is how do you reconcile the various approaches and guidelines provided with the ones provided under the EU taxonomy so not sure Madeline whether you would be able to give that one a stab yeah, of course. Um, so, as I also said before, um, this is a um, working definition. So, we are also con constantly reviewing um, new definitions um, coming up. Um, but um, uh, at the moment, the, the EU, uh, the definition from the EU Commission is included. Um, but as I said, we will constantly follow up here and um, adjust um, if necessary, also particularly on the thresholds for um, energy, if what highly energy efficient means um, with the revision of the EPPD and so forth. So we're con con constantly evaluating that. Yeah. But if you if you have uh, a suggestion, what you don't think is um, included yet, um, you find actually all definitions that we considered in the annex, then please reach out to me and um, we will have a look, of course. Thank you very much, Madeline. I don't see any other hands raised or any additional questions in the chat, and I imagine people need to get back to their busy schedules and tasks. So I. I imagine we will close our <laughs> meeting here. Um, just one point as the, at the Global Alliance for Buildings and Construction, we are uh, trying to support more and work more closely with our colleagues from the UNEP Finance Initiative and to actually create those links and to be able to support financial institutions more on, on this transition to our net zero buildings. So feel free also to reach out to us uh, are, if there are any specific points or issues you would like us to look into that we could jointly develop uh, with our colleagues from UNEPFI. And um, Trisha, I hand over to you for the final word. Thank you, thank you, I appreciate it. And thank you everyone for joining today. Um, the recording and the slides will be available on the NCBA members webpage um, afterwards. And please do re reach out if you have any other questions. All right. Enjoy the rest of your day, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Thanks a lot. Have a good day. Bye-bye.